Hello and welcome to Real Talk. I am Eklund Anderson and this is my co-host Denise Edie Richardson. Hello everyone. As you know, here on Real Talk, we focus on family, health, community, restoration, and church, giving real solutions from the Word for very real problems. We have with us Derek Jackson. Hi, everyone. Derek is rooted in Washtenaw County. He is active in multiple organizations. He serves on the board of Washtenaw My Brother's Keeper in the Ann Arbor YMCA, United Way of Washtenaw County, Washtenaw Technical Middle College, and Washtenaw Justice Project, just to name a few. Welcome to Real Talk, Derek. Thank you for having me. Glad to have you here. So, today we have you as a special guest because there's something special that's going on in your life right now. You want to tell us a little bit about it? Uh, absolutely. Um, I'm running for sheriff here in Washtenaw County. The election is not till next August, so we're a year okay. out. But uh I've been at the sheriff's office for 14 years. My boss, my big brother, is retiring. And with his blessing, we are now stepping in to fill his shoes and continue the work that we've uh, been doing for the last 14 years. Okay, wow. Well, that's great. Great to hear it. So you have a whole year of campaigning ahead of you. Yes, absolutely. So I know you probably get asked this question a lot, but, mm -hmm. you know, our, vid our um, audience would want to know, can you tell us a little bit about your qualifications mm -hmm. for as a candidate for uh, Washtenaw County Sheriff. Yeah, well, I'm a social worker who became a police officer, and okay. I know that sometimes that seems a little bit odd, how this social worker become a police officer. We're getting a little bit more used to social workers and policing, but 14 years ago, it was unheard of. Mm -hmm. And where I'm from, born and raised in Inkster, uh, we didn't have the best relationship with police, so I never envisioned being a police officer. I came into social work to really help people. Um, but just the meandering pathway, uh, this gentleman was running to be sheriff and he had this crazy idea. Derek, you're this community guy who works with young people. What if you could do that work within a police agency? And honestly, when he first asked me, I laughed. It didn't make any sense to me. It didn't seem like something that could be done. You mean what I do in community to do through a police agency? Um, and j just a small side note, back in 2006 where I was living in West Willow, the very agency that I now help to run, one of my neighbors was in handcuffs, Mr. Lee, and he died. Oh. And so to imagine me um, all these years later, in 2007, this man is asking me to come work for the very agency where one of my neighbors had died in handcuffs, that just gives you a picture of I never could have imagined I would be sitting here in front of you today, not only as an officer, but thinking about running for sheriff. But I keep telling people, like, the issues are too important. Um, and, the, and, the, and the things are just too important for me not to think about running for sheriff. Well, that's some kind of experience. Mm -hmm. It is one of those type of situations that make a change for you in your life at that time. Can you tell us about some of those issues that are occurring right now that you would be focusing on if you were Wayne County Sheriff? Uh, Washington, 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 Washington County. County. <laughs> I'm from Wayne County. I'm sorry, everybody. <laughs> Wayne County Sheriff to get away. Washington County. Um, I think there's a number of things. Uh, because I'm born and raised in Inkster, um, I grew up in an environment where I thought everybody knew someone who had been murdered, mm -hmm. knew someone who had um, died of homicide. So for me, there's something like ingrained within my DNA of like, I really want to deal with the issue of gun violence on our streets. Mm -hmm. I helped to facilitate our local community violence intervention team. And so it's just a passion of mine. I think about the young men that I grew up with, and then I see the young men that I get to work with now. And honestly, I see these young black men who remind me of myself. Um, right after this, I'm going back to a neighborhood where two young men were murdered. Mm -hmm. And we're handing out backpacks to kids. And I see the faces of those young people, and they are forever scarred with violence. And so for me, that's one of my number one priorities, is how do we deal with gun violence in our community? And I can talk all day about all the the ways in which I envision us doing that, but that's number one. Uh, number two, domestic violence is a uh -huh. huge issue. Yeah. Not just because it's a um, uh, serious thing as the number of people that are dealing with domestic violence in their household, but it really ties back into community violence. When we look at the data, the number of young people that grow up in a household with domestic violence or serious assault, and then they become older and they perpetuate that same violence, those victims becoming victimizers, so there's a direct connection to future violence if you don't deal with domestic violence of these young people. And then I have to mention the other, the other big one for me, because I'm a social worker and I think about people's mental health, is really just officer wellness. Mm -hmm. We don't do a good job of like taking care of our officers, and yet we ask them to 
police in our communities and take care of people when they're not taking care of themselves. And so again, I could talk uh, a long time about all those issues, but those are three primary ones for me, which is really driving me to this. And then the final thing I'll say about this, I have three beautiful daughters. The youngest one is only seven months. The next oh, one is 19 months. Thank congratulations. you very much. <laughs> and I think about safety for them. Mm -hmm. I just think about their lives 10, 15, 20 years from now. And that's a just driving motivation for me to do whatever I can do to make this community better. Right. So one of the issues that I think of based upon, you know, some things that you said is racism. Racism mm -hmm. um, from a police standpoint and from a violence standpoint. Right. So what what are your plans for the Washtenaw County Sheriff's Office for educating your officers along with providing wellness, but providing education? Yeah, I think um, so. The one thing that I get to talk about is. People sometimes run for office and they say, well, I promise I would do this or I could do this if I had your support. And what mm -hmm. I keep telling people is we can do that, but also you can just look at the track record over the last 14 years. So we can mm -hmm. point to real things we've done. One example, we take all of our new deputies through an orientation. And one of those days of orientation, we take some young people from Ypsilanti, from a local nonprofit organization here, and we give them the day. And we say, you as young people of Ipsy, you train our new deputies before they ever get that badge and could patrol our streets, you teach them of what it means to be an officer in your community. Mm -hmm. And it might sound small and just, you know, minuscule, but that's pretty significant for a young person to be able to teach an officer about what, the, what, what really their community is about. Um, but even deeper than that, it's about the kind of competencies that you want in an officer. Mm -hmm. So traditional policing, you're thinking about somebody who has this A-type personality. I know how to fight, drive fast, those kinds of things. You sometimes need that. But we also know that officers, more likely than not, are dealing with people. They need to understand community. They right. need to value people. They need to check their own implicit bias. And so part of it is who we hire and the kinds of things we're looking for is just different at the Washington County Sheriff's Office than the traditional agency. And then the final one I'll say is it is about training. Mm -hmm. For any behavior, um, training, policy, and oversight. If you have those three things, you can manage someone's behavior. They may not have the same values as us around this table, but if I can give them the policy that is clear, if I can train them to that policy and give them the right expectations, and then I have the oversight ability to make sure they're doing what we want them to do, then you can manage that behavior. And so for me, it's about those things we've already put in place, but also expanding it and continuing to move some of this forward. Right. So often, training with regard to uh, racial issues, with regard to inclusion, with regard to even uh, their own mental health yes. with regard to the mental health issues within the community because that, that's significant in policing also is a sort of one and done you mm -hmm. know we're going to train you we're going to give you this good training yeah. of the day and then you are off in your squad car on your beat wherever you are tell us about the framework yeah for training yeah. within Washtenaw County? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think we're fortunate, people don't really know this, but our current sheriff, Jerry Clayton, like he's an educator. And so his, his real skill set is curriculum development. And so just to give you one example, and then I'll come back to your specific question. The mental health training that we created here in Washtenaw County to train our deputies on how to deal with people, not from a criminal behavior, but around behavioral health issues, is now one of the required trainings, a part of what we've done here is required for every new recruit and uh, person who wants to go into the police academy across the state of Michigan. So when I say these things, it's not just making them up, like there's some real outcomes to it. But to get back to your question, um, the idea or the notion that uh, culture eats policy for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So if you don't change the culture, doesn't matter what the policy says, doesn't matter what the training is, I'm gonna check that box, you're gonna be in your office, I'm gonna be on the road doing what I wanna do. And so it really is about changing the culture. At the same time we've been at the sheriff's office, Ann Arbor City has had eight police chiefs. So in 14 years, they've had eight leadership changes. I don't care how good you are. When you're changing that often, you can't instill a particular culture. Uh -huh. The deputies at the sheriff's office have known for 14 years, these are our expectations, these are our values, it is about quality service, it, our mission is about building strong and sustainable communities and co-creating community. So when you think about that, those are social work values that are instilled into um, a police agency. So to your question, it really is about changing the culture. Part of why I wanna run is that we're not done. Mm -hmm. If I thought we were done, I wouldn't be here with you, I'd be home with my baby girls playing on the floor right now. 
but the issues are too important and the stakes are too high. Like we have a lot of work to do. We've come far, but we still have a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. So really cultural shift and cultural change is the number one thing I think for any police agency. You can say it, I can sound good on your show, Mm -hmm. but if our deputies are out there treating you wrong when they pull you over later on, it doesn't matter what I say. So it's about that cultural shift I think is really important. How diverse is your uh, sheriff department? Not enough. Um, We are much more diverse in the jail, believe it or not. Um, We are very well represented with black women in the jail, uh, with black males in the jail, just diverse across the board in corrections. But when you get to the road, and there's a number of reasons for it. Number one is the historical perspective of policing. When I was growing up in Inkster, again, I could have never imagined I wanted to be an officer. We didn't like the police. Okay, so let me stop you there. Yeah. Because I want to know about the evolution of your thoughts on the police. Mm-hmm. You know? That's great. great That's a question. good question. So um, when the sheriff asked me to do this, my original reaction was no. And at the time, remember, my neighbor had died at the hands of the sheriff's office. My neighborhood had asked me to be the representative to go talk to the uh, previous sheriff about that issue. And when I went into his office, my only job was to get him to come to our neighborhood watch meeting. And he simply looked at me and he said, no. And I said, but sheriff, It'll be safe. We know you didn't do it. We know you can't say everything because it's an ongoing investigation, but my neighbor just want to hear from the sheriff. And he said, sorry, Derek, no. And I never forgot what it felt like at that moment to be told no, but more importantly, to go back to my neighborhood and tell my neighbors that I failed you. I could not convince him. And our neighborhood was on the verge of being on fire. It was tense. And then I'm talking to my father about this job opportunity. And I said, can you believe he thinks he can do what I do in community and the police agency? And he said, stop. If you really mean what you say about wanting change in policing, then get in there and do it. Because you can stand on the outside, marching in the streets, pounding on the door, and the people on the inside that don't want change will simply make that door stronger and build bigger walls. Why don't you get in there, change it from the inside, unlock the door, and then let everybody else in. And that really changed my entire perspective of taking the opportunity to step into the sheriff's office versus only working from the outside to force change major barriers in effectuating change? Wow, Um, it's a good question. I think some of it is just really the time. It is also the paradigm shift. I see the world a certain way, trying to get people within an agency that historically has operated one way to see how community really um, sees the police and why, to understand the historical barriers. All those things take time. When a young officer comes into our agency, I really believe that they come into it for the right reasons. I want to help people. Mm -hmm. When I started, I asked every officer, why did you become a police officer? And they answered it very similar to why my peers in social work say they become social workers, to help people. But then they start doing the work, they get trained a certain way, they get certain tools or lack of certain tools, and then they treat people certain ways. And then the nature of the job starts to build up this armor around them and they forget how to just talk to people. So a part of the challenge is, how do I take this blank slate that is a brand new officer and as they're just responding to call after call after call and ipsy, that that's not the only thing that they put on their slate. How do we as a sheriff's office provide them opportunities to meet people, to learn from people, to understand that Mm -hmm. people are complex. It's not just the 911 call and meeting with someone on their worst day. There are all these other things that you can do. And then the other piece is providing them the tools. If all we teach them to do is to drive fast, to fight, and shoot, then whenever they're in a difficult situation, those are the tools they know how to use. What about all these other tools that we can provide to them Mm -hmm. so now they can actually utilize them? Part of my job, people see me on television and they say, oh, he's the public information officer. I do that work, but my real job was understanding the system, deconstructing it, and then rebuilding it in a way that provides officers these tools so that they don't have to be Superman or Superwoman. They can refer to somebody else to do the work that they don't know how to do, or they can do it in partnership. So we have a social worker and a police officer in the same car. Yeah, that's important. So there's all these different things that we have done to kind of put those pieces in place. Mm -hmm. So another thing that came into my mind with regards to issues is drugs in the community. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on how to prevent or, you know, to... uh, work on that in the community. Yeah, that's, that's, wow, that's a hard one because 
we often say that crime is not a police problem. It's a community issue. Mm -hmm. Addiction is not a police problem, although we get called to deal with it, right? Um, it is a community issue. And so a part of it is whoever sits in that sheriff's office seat can use the megaphone and the platform of the sheriff to elevate certain issues. We've done it with community violence. Mm -hmm. We've done it around mental health. You know, we have a mental health and public safety millage in Washington. Why? Because our sheriff said that mental health and the lack of quality services is a public safety issue. Yeah. Put those together, now people are talking about mental health different. And the same thing around uh, addiction and substance mm -hmm. use disorder. There are things that we can do. We are one of the largest treatment facilities at the Washtenaw County Jail. We shouldn't be, but we are. Because people in our jail, lots of them are homeless, lots of them suffer from mental health challenges, and lots of them are uh, addicted. And so part of it is just elevating these issues and then working with community partners to really invest government dollars into these community-based organizations. We invest $4.7 million of our budget into alternatives to policing, which is community corrections, re-entry, engagement, diversion, and deflection. So again, not just, oh, I want to run for office, Denise, and here are the things that I would do. We've literally invested this money already year after year to the tune of almost $5 million a year to do just this kind of work. Feel like any budget cuts are coming your way? And, oh, uh, wow, that's, oof. I mean, because um, that can prevent you from doing a lot of things. It sure can. Um, In our economy, say, you know. Yes. It sure can. I think that, um, so yes, the budget is always going to be an issue, right? Mm -hmm. It's a $60 million organization. And so a sheriff has to really know how to operate a $60 right. million dollar budget, right? Um, do I know about budget? Because I wouldn't say right now, the thing that I would say is that um, the, the budget is so complex. We're a contract police agency. So somewhere where I live, like Ipsy Township, they contract with us to be their local police agency. So those contracts fluctuate from time to time. There's lots of questions about those. The jail is the biggest part of our budget, which comes out of the county general fund. Community corrections and a lot of the programs that I run are millage or grant funded. So there's a okay. diversity of how the funding comes in. But I will say this. There was a time when Washington County paid our staff very well, and our benefit packages attracted some of the best in the profession. Those days are gone. And so our officers are high need, and so people are grabbing them from us because they do great work. So the ability to retain and hire staff and to keep them here is a huge challenge for um, for the future for us. How are you going to meet it? Wow. I think one thing is there are some who like to divide us. I often talk about bringing people together. And I'm going to give you an example and come back to your question. The idea of unarmed, non-police responders. Some will say police don't want it. Some community activists do. I asked every single officer as I was doing a training, would you be against unarmed non-police responders responding to loud music, parties, or firework calls? And they were like, no. In fact, they were like, when can we sign up so that we don't have to go and others can go? And so around these difficult issues, we're actually a lot closer aligned than people assume that we are. Mm -hmm. So how do we meet it is bringing people together so our officers feel value, that they get the tools to be effective. I didn't become a social worker because I knew I was going to be wealthy. I became a social worker because my values aligned with doing the work. And for our deputies, how do we make sure that their values align with this work? They may not get rich off of doing this work, but they can see well, so they much Well, they will change. not get rich, will they? No, <laughs> I mean, no, let, no. let's put it out there right. uh, as it is. They will not, they will public not services, rich. not a get-rich <laughs> endeavor. At we all. know this. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. Yes. I want to take you back to what you said about the jail being the largest treatment facility. Yes. Tell me what that treatment looks like in the jail. So one of my uh, roles has been to, again, deconstruct the jail and put it back together. So we created this reentry for all idea that we know. We looked at the data. Someone who comes into our jail 8, 9, 10, 11 times, they're not violent. If they were violent, they would have been off to prison, but they're in jail. So when you look behind the numbers and you say, why is someone here 11 times? What you find out is... Petty larceny kinds of stuff, drug possession, mental health, people are calling on them, they're homeless. And so if you really want to deal with the issue, you need to bring the services into the jail. Otherwise, they will get out, commit a small crime, and they'll come right back. And we're just wasting time, all of us. The cycle of insanity, doing the same thing over and over, hoping for a different result. And so what we did was after we looked at that, then we brought in my social work friends. And we said, look, we operate the jail. This is really a community jail. 
We need those who are the experts in education to come in, redo our entire educational system. So in the Washtenaw County Jail, not only can you get your GED, you can complete high school, you can start taking classes for job completion and job readiness. You can actually take free classes at Washington Community College to get certified in a trade or in a skill. When you look at um, addiction, Dawn Farm and Home and Division, we partner with them to come in and do the work. Same thing around housing, Avalon Housing yeah. works right in the jail. So for all these things, we've intertwined community-based organizations to do the work in the jail to help people. All right. So tell me some of the things that you're most proud of. I mean, wow. you've given us a litany of things already, but <laughs> there's always something yeah, when you work I, that just hits the top of your list. The street outreach team. Okay. So the very first thing I did 14 years ago was I hired some people who had been to jail or prison to be the community experts, not to sweep our floors or be informants, but literally to be experts on community. And now 14 years later, they're like the conscience of the sheriff's office, and they're so connected to neighborhoods. If I had to pick one specific program, I'll say it's a program called We Live, which when someone is violently injured or shot or stabbed and they're in a the hospital, we have great hospital systems to patch them up and send them on their way. But no one's dealing with the psychological trauma that breeds fear, anger, resentment, and then retaliation. Mm -hmm. About 80% to 85% of the shootings in our county is retaliatory. So we take folks who've been violently injured, we hire them, train them, and then they go into the hospital bedside and they start working with people to hopefully deal with that trauma so they never come out and pull that trigger. When I think about the work that I've done, um, those are something that gives me chills just even thinking about some of the work and some of the lives that have shifted, knowing that they did not pick up that weapon to attempt to take another life. They got a long road to recovery, yeah. but they have not pulled the trigger. That's something I didn't think about. So that was a great question with a great response. Absolutely, that's how social work fits into policing mm -hmm. in ways that we could not think. You know, you 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 know, I'm older, so you watched all of these um, police shows, and you see the police officers going down the street chasing after mm -hmm. folks, but you don't see the police officer who you know stops and talks to the kids yeah. that's you know doing something wrong. Usually, see them running after the police. So it'll be. I mean, running after the kids. So it'll be good to see the sheriff's office um, become stronger in the community. Mm -hmm. I know there have been issues, you know, in the past with uh, driving while black. Mm -hmm. I know that Ann Arbor has made some changes. Are you guys considering those type of changes in Washtenaw County so as well? My Ann Arbor counterparts, but I'll say we're ahead of that. Um, and so I'll give you one example. So what Ann Arbor did was around pretext stops, these small infractions that you stop someone. But what I ask people is, what's the reason that an officer who wants to abuse a pretext stop, why are they pulling you over for that minor infraction? Mm -hmm. They want to search your vehicle. So what we did was we changed our consent search policy. I can't even ask you to search your vehicle unless I have a real evidentiary reason that I would even ask that question. Mm -hmm. And then if I asked you, it's got to be on body camera, you got a sign that you're okay with allowing me, and then any point in my search, if you gave consent, you can say stop. You put those things in place, now we're changing behavior. So the idea around pretext stops sounds good, but the motor vehicle code is huge. I can find a reason to stop you if I really want to. Mm -hmm. I'm not getting to the behavior by just eliminating pretext stops. By dealing with consent searches, the real reason why I might stop you in the first place, now I'm changing your behavior. And it doesn't matter what the motor vehicle code is. I'm not even stopping you to search you unless there's some real evidentiary reason to do that. So we've already put that in place. Um, I can't wait for people to be able to see the data. We have a dashboard, um, uh, data dashboard getting ready to release in the next yeah, couple Yeah, because I was getting ready to ask you for yeah, it. Yeah, I can't <laughs> wait. I can't. So, so listen, I'm not the sheriff yet. Uh, so my boss will I'm be like, let upset. me see those stats right <laughs> yeah, now. He would be upset with me if I jump ahead of him on this. But I will yeah. say I can't wait for the public to be able to have this discussion around that data. Yeah, because as a parent with two um, adult boys, I call them boys, but they would say men, mm -hmm. um, it's important that we know that they can drive their vehicle safely and not be harassed That's by right. the police. And we know that in the past, there's not many communities where you don't see that happening. Right. You yeah. know, So it's good to know that you guys are moving forward with fixing that. We are, and I'll just tell you, although again, we've made progress, I'm running for sheriff because we're not done, right? This is like the infinite mindset. You're always improving and getting better. And so there's still a lot of work to be done yeah. in all of these areas.
And um, we, we kind of talked about it a few minutes ago, but I'd like to get back into it. Mm -hmm. um, diversity in your yeah. um, department. How are you, what are your plans for that? So one of the things we've already done and how we continue to expand it is, back in the day, you used to be able to sponsor someone. Mm -hmm. So part of what prevents some of us from going into the profession, it costs a, a several thousand dollars just to go to the academy. Mm -hmm. And it's like an 18-week academy, six or seven days a week. So you can't work while you're in the academy. So you've got to have resources to even go to the academy. I can't hire you as a police officer unless you go to the academy and graduate. And now you're certifiable and I can hire you. So what we did was we started sponsoring people, specific individuals that we will pay for you to go to the academy and remove that financial barrier. Mm -hmm. The other thing we did was we started these, um, we call it park service officer position, where a young person in college or even later in high school who might think about policing but doesn't quite know, they can get a part-time job with us for the summer. We get to see how they operate. They're in a uniform. They don't have any arrest authority, but they're almost like a park ranger. And so it is really good for the young person to work for the summer, gain that experience, but for us to, us to know who they are. And we've seen, quite honestly, quite candidly, some of the current black officers that we have have come through the Park Service officer position. Mm -hmm. So it's about continuing that and expanding it. And the other part is, I know what it's like to be a kid growing up in Inkster who look at the police because my father said, when you see the police, get out of there. It's like a fire drill for two reasons. Something bad has happened, you don't want to be around, or they're up to no good and you don't want to be around. Mm -hmm. we got to change that narrative. Mm -hmm. I need to be able to go into my neighborhood and talk to these young kids about the honor in policing and what you can do to change the very nature of the organization, but also to change your community. So those are just a few of the ways that I think we've started, but we still, again, have a long way to go. Well, that's great. And I want to thank you for joining us today. I don't want to leave an entire congregation. You can't control what other people do, Elijah. That's my brother, man. Yes, and he has free will just like you do. That's all for our show today. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you, Derek. It has been a pleasure. Remember, earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. We'll see you next week. God bless. If you would like to help support this broadcast or become a sponsor, visit realtalktoday.com. Remember to join our Facebook page and follow us on Instagram. And subscribe to our YouTube channel. We would love to hear your thoughts of our show, so we look forward to hearing from you. If you're in the Ypsilanti, Michigan area and would like to be a part of our show, visit realtalktoday.com to find out how. Until next time, keep it real.